Good morning. What's your ambition? Anybody ever asked you that? What do you really want to do with the rest of your life? I wonder if you've got something in mind, something that gets you out of bed in the morning, something that whenever you think about it, it just really gets you ticking, um, something that catches your imagination. What's your ambition? What do you want to really do with your life? What about bringing joy to the whole world? How about that as an ambition? And that was the ambition of the people that we read about in the psalm earlier on, Psalm 67. They wanted not just to be blessed by God, not just to know him, but they wanted the whole world to sing for joy. They wanted what they had to be something that everybody shares. I wonder if that's something that's your ambition. Or is your ambition just about yourself and your uh, own growth or your own achievements or your own things? Or I wonder if your ambition is something you could share with everyone. See, that is, if you're a Christian, that's something that should be all of our ambition, is to bring joy to the whole of the world. That's what Jesus is talking about in Matthew chapter 28. We've been working through over the last few weeks since uh, the beginning of the new year. We've been working through Matthew 28, 18 to 20, looking at Jesus's great commission. Jesus sending out his disciples, you and me, not just the 11 back in the day, but everybody who follows him. Jesus is sending us out to the whole world to give them the message about him, to share the news of Jesus, who's died for us, who's risen for us, and now who's king over the whole world. So you see that commission, Jesus' commission, is all about people knowing him. And the people in Psalm 67 say, to know him is to know joy. To know him is to know justice. To know him is to know the one who's given us so many blessings and wants us to pour them out to others. You see, if you're a Christian, if you're somebody who knows God, who've been blessed by him, then you're supposed to be a highway of blessing for others, a highway for his blessings to flow out, to drive out, to be distributed to the whole of the world. So that's a little bit of this Great Commission that we're focusing on today, is the whole world bit, where Jesus says in verse 18, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, so the whole world is under me, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. For how long? Is it just those 11? Well, no, surely I am with you always to the end of the age. So he wants us to be going and doing this to the end of the age, telling the whole world about the one who's king over the whole world. That's basically all I'm going to talk about today. That Jesus has called us to do really what he's always wanted us to do. What God has made this world to do, to know him in every small corner of it. Last week, if you were around, I think it was last week, Sammy was talking about how Jesus is, is king over everything. How he looks at the whole of creation and says, mine, 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 absolutely every square inch. He looks at it and, and says, mine, it belongs to him. Well, today we're looking at, maybe you could think of it as like the opposite of that. Today we're looking at how we're supposed to go and and help the world, help every person who lives in every corner look at God and say, you're mine. He is mine. I belong to you and you belong to me. Do you see that? Jesus owns the world. He's the king, the, the one who's in authority over all of it. And he looks at us and says, mine. And we're supposed to go out and tell the world all about him so that we can look to him and say, God, you are my God and I'm yours. You've blessed me and so I bless you. You have loved me, and so I love you. And that's something that is for all nations. It's a faith, it's a blessing that's supposed to cross borders. It's supposed to spill out from our own hearts to our neighbours next door, to their neighbours next door, from our country to the countries next door, from our language to the languages of people next door. It's something that's just too big and too good to fit in a small box. It's something for the world to enjoy. That's our ambition. That's Jesus' ambition. That's why he gives us his authority and why he promised us his presence, his comfort with us, so that we would be able to go and tell the world about him and that they might share his joy. It's a pretty cool vision, isn't it? That it's not just something between me and God, but it's something for everybody to enjoy. So let's get into it a little bit more uh, and dig into the basics. Well. Like I said, this is something that the whole Bible speaks about. It's the whole story. So we could start with Adam. Think of Adam and what is the job of 
him and the first woman Eve. Well, they marry and they're supposed to fill the earth with babies, fill every corner of the earth with people who know God and love him. They're supposed to fill the world with God's glory. But then that goes wrong. They get kicked out of the garden and the earth, instead of being filled with God's glory, gets filled with sadness and darkness, the kind of stuff that we feel every day. And so there isn't joy, there isn't blessing, there isn't a beautiful garden with abundance to eat and love flowing between people and between us and the world and the, even the ground underneath and, and us and our God and God and us. Instead, the world isn't flowing with milk and honey and goodness and love. The world is flowing with darkness and with blood and with sin and with tears. And so God brings a promise. In time, God promises to another man whose name begins with A called Abraham and says, Abraham, I want you to begin a new people, a new nation. Your children will be as many as the sand on the seashore. They'll have a place to live. And most of all, best of all, they'll have my blessing. But it won't just be for you, Abraham. This blessing will be for all the people of the world. The whole world, all nations will be blessed through you through your descendants, particularly through one descendant, through Jesus. But we don't get to him just yet. In the Old Testament, you maybe get to a story like Joseph. And Joseph is a story about a man who goes far away from home, not of his own choosing. He gets sold into slavery by his brothers, goes down into a pit, literally, goes down into a prison, is pretty much written off, left for dead, but then rises up out of that pit, out of prison, and becomes the prince of the whole of Egypt. There's a film about that, the prince of Egypt. And what does he end up doing? He ends up providing food, bread, for the whole world. His 11 brothers come and bow down at his feet, almost worship him, and he gives them bread. And that's, hopefully, giving us echoes of Matthew 28, the scene here. 11 disciples, who Jesus calls his brothers, in verse 10 of chapter 28. His brothers come along, and they fall down at his feet, and then he, he picks them up and says, come on. Let's go to the world and give them bread. I want to feed the world with the joy of knowing me, their king, and knowing their presence. And then you go I mean, maybe to Isaiah, further on in the Old Testament, and you see that Israel, this people of God, is supposed to be God's light to the Gentiles, light to the nations, to all the people who, who aren't Israel. They're supposed to know the light as well. It's not just a private thing. It's supposed to be a spreading thing. And then you could go to the New Testament, and after Jesus' death and resurrection, what happens? Well, these disciples and a bunch of others too are in a, in a room waiting and God's Holy Spirit comes down upon them and into them. And they're given his power and his presence. And what do they do? What do they do with God's power and presence within them and among them? Well, the first thing that happens is they start to be able to speak the language, languages of the different peoples around them. They start to be able to share the good news of Jesus with other nations. The newborn church immediately goes international. It's not just something for a few people in Israel. It's not just something for me and you to enjoy privately between us and God. No, this blessing, this joy is something for everyone. It's brilliant, isn't it? You see, that's why Jesus promises. Matthew 20, he promises his power, or he tells us about his power. He's the king, has authority over everything, heaven and on earth. And he tells us, promises us his presence. I'll be with you to the end of the age. And what happens when his power and his presence come into our lives, when we recognize who he is, that he's the king, and when we have his Holy Spirit and he's with us as our king, well, we go international. So are you a Christian? Are you somebody who knows Jesus as your king? Does he have authority over your life? Have you bowed the knee to him? Are you somebody who knows him closely, you know, his presence as well as his power. Well, if you're a Christian, if you're somebody who's, who's given your life to him and known his life poured into you, well, then you're somebody who's supposed to go international. You're supposed to cross borders. You're supposed to be somebody who has an ambition together with the rest of the church to take this joy globally, to take the blessings that you have and share them with the person next door, with the country next door, with the languages next door, with the world next door. But how do we do that? And is that a job for, for all of us? And what kind of place do I have? I mean, some of us can't literally up sticks and move next door. I mean, to a country next door or to a land far away. Maybe 
maybe we've got family ties that that tie us down here in in a good way you know we've got people that we need to look after and people who rely on us and so we can't just up sticks and move or maybe you're you're still being educated you're still in school or university or maybe your um, your body isn't what it used to be and you're tied to um to living here so you can't move and does that mean you can't play a part in this no let me tell you a story okay this is the story of a guy called um derek matungu he was a student a couple of decades ago um, he was a student in bath Came over, studied at the Technical College there, and then later went on to London and studied at Imperial College in London. Um, and while he was here, he wasn't a Christian before he came, but while he was here, a few Christians befriended him. And then a family from a local church took him in and gave him a few dinners, kind of became good friends with him. And over time, he became a Christian himself. Derek gave his life to Jesus. He knew God's power and his presence in his life. And eventually he went back to Zambia. He went back and was so impressed by all the stuff that he'd seen among university students, among churches here, that he wanted to start a Christian group in his university back in Zambia. So he did. And he eventually, after he graduated, became one of the first Christian student workers in Zambia. And before long, about one in ten, a tenth of all the students in Zambia had become Christians. The gospel, the good news of Jesus in his power, in his presence to love us and forgive us, people had become Christians. They'd known that power and that presence and, and it was turning the country upside down. So one day the president got hold of Derek, invited him to come um, to the palace with the local student leaders and said to him, what is this message you're preaching which is turning the university upside down? So little Kenneth, who'd been in the home of some family, we don't know their names, who'd been befriended by some who knows who students, um, he had been invited into the palace of the president and asked to share the gospel. And so Derek told him, this is how it goes in this book, Kenneth Coander, the president, was moved to tears when he heard the good news of Jesus. This, he said, is the message our culture needs to hear. Come back in two weeks and bring the other student leaders with you. Derek and the leaders of the Christian Union returned two weeks later to the presidential palace to meet the entire Zambian cabinet. Now, said Dr. Coander, the president, preach to them what you preach to me. And so they did. So the writer of this book concludes, through the kindness shown in Bath to one student far away from home, God was sovereignly establishing a Christian witness among students in another country. And through those students, the gospel message would be preached to their government. That's a pretty cool story, isn't it? Those Christians who be befriended Derek, that family that took him in for a few dinners, they didn't, as far as we know, up sticks and move to another country, but God used them to send ripples, shockwaves of good news to countries far, far away from their homeland. So if you can't leave, if you can't move, it doesn't mean you can't be involved. It just means that you start here. You start where you are. You share that good news with the people next door. You speak about Jesus to the people in your family, to the people around you, to the international students or the people from other countries who are in our midst, who are around us. Share the good news wherever we are. There's other things that we can do as well. If you're here and you're, you're not able to up sticks and move, the other obvious thing you can do is pray. I mean, if Jesus really is the authority, the one who's over absolutely everything, and if you can speak to him and ask him for things in prayer, well then, isn't that the most powerful thing you could do? Isn't that the most powerful thing you could do? To speak to him and say, Lord, would you do something? In this country would you help that person who's working over there would you move and show people your power bring people your presence that they would know your salvation that they would walk in your ways that's something that the people in psalm 67 were singing about do you remember they were saying may god be gracious and bless us make his fine his face shine upon us that's verse one so that your ways may be known on the earth your salvation among all peoples they're praying for it they're working for it. They're asking God to make it happen, that his salvation, his power would be known and his ways would be known as well. But you can go, you can pray, you can share the good news with the people around you. There's other things you could do as well. You could give. I mean, it costs money to go abroad, to set up life over there, to give yourself to sharing the good news with others. So we could give. If you don't have much money, well, you could probably afford a stamp and a postcard. 
And if you're part of our church, then there's a good number of missionaries who, um, who work abroad who would really be encouraged by you st- sending them a little postcard of encouragement or a little packet of you know, Cadbury's dairy milk uh, and sending them a little encouragement to say, hey, we're thinking of you, we're praying for you, we're, we've got your back. So let's do that, even if we, we can barely move from our front rooms. Maybe you've been stuck at home for the best part of the last couple of years. Well, there's still plenty that you can do to be right in the center of God's work in the world. Those people who befriended Derek Matungu, the ripples of the gospel that, that they put into his life, well, those ripples went all the way out to Zambia. I wonder if they could ever imagine what, it would, what kind of effects their kindness to him would have been like. So who's around you? Who could you be sharing kindness and goodness with? I wonder where those ripples would go. But maybe that's not your issue. Maybe you kind of would quite like to go, but you feel like you just don't really have the gifts for it, or you just aren't smart enough, or maybe you feel a bit too old. Like, how, how could I learn a language now and go abroad? Because this passage should, really should, cause each one of us to think seriously about whether we should go. I mean, not all of us can go. Not all of us must go. We've all got to be involved in it. But all of us, I think, should be considering whether we should go or not. Whether we should physically up sticks and count the cost and take the risk and move abroad. Well, can I give you another story? It's a story of a woman called Gladys Aylward. You can see her, st- well, sort of her story. Um, it's kind of Hollywoodized, but depicted in a film called The Inn of the Sixth Happiness. I'm not sure where you could find it, but you could Google it. The Inn of the Sixth Happiness and watch a kind of Hollywoodized um, version of her story with Ingrid Bergman as the lead actress, filmed in North Wales. Um, it's a pretty good film. But anyway, Gladys Aylward, you can Wikipedia her and kind of get the true story. But she was uh, a young woman who, um, who didn't have many job prospects. She was kind of working in service in, uh, in the 1930s, 1940s, around then. And she, she didn't have much money, didn't have much education. In fact, when she joined a mission organization trying to get to China, she failed the exams, tried really hard to learn Chinese and, and failed, <laughs> couldn't do it. And so they wrote her off. They were basically said, sorry, Gladys Love, you're not cut out for this. And they stopped her funding, kicked her out of the mission and said, this isn't for you. But she wouldn't be deterred. Um, She went on, got herself some more training, and eventually saved up enough money for a train ticket from London to China. Bought a ticket, literally, on the Trans-Siberian Railway, and got on the train at Liverpool Street Station, and took the train across the world, and ended up eventually in China. It was a pretty epic journey, you can go and read about it later if you want, but she ended up meeting up with a missionary called Jeannie Lawson, who died about a year after Gladys arrived, and she ended up starting an amazing work just a humble servant woman with not much money or stuff, not much education or training, a bit too old to learn Chinese, so they thought. She ended up starting an amazing work. An amazing work in an inn that used to take in men who were a bit like the long distance truckers of their day. They would take pack mules across the mountains in China. So they took them in, into the inn, shared the gospel through stories with them, day by day, night by night. And then these truckers, (laughs) mule runners would take the stories on with them. That was the idea, to share the good news with these people who were gonna be traveling around um, East Asia anyway. And they, well, who knows where they'd end up with the seeds of the gospel in their hearts, bringing other seeds to who knows who, taking the blessing they'd received from Gladys and Jeannie and the people who worked there and taking them out to others. Her story is just amazing, of a humble woman who everybody thought wasn't cut out for it, but ended up having an amazing effect, doing really wonderful things in China. Go and look her up, Gladys Aylward. There's loads more to her story that I can't get into right now. But this is such good news, isn't it? It's good news, not just for me, it's good news for the world. And good news that all of us can be involved, whether through praying, through giving, through sending others and sending encouragement to others, or whether through really seriously considering whether we should go ourselves. I wonder if that's something that you'll pray about and pray for in the next few weeks. Well, can I give you one last encouragement as we go? One last encouragement is that this is the path that Jesus has trodden. He doesn't just stand there saying, I'm the king, so you should go. No, he comes with us. And not only by his spirit in his presence, but do you see? He's the one who left his home to come to us and rescue us. He's the one who left the comfort of heaven to come down and and help us to know God. 
to bring us to him. He's the one who left it all behind, who took great risk, who even went to give up his own life so that we could know his salvation, so that we could walk in his ways. That's the path that Jesus walked, leaving everything behind, taking great risk to himself, but doing it all for the, for the glory of his Father. So what's your life ambition? Will your life ambition be like Jesus's? That's his ambition, was to bring joy to the world, to help the world sing, not just a few people, but people from every tribe, every language, every nation, people from every single corner of the world that belongs to him. He wants to give them the joy of turning and saying, we belong to you. Lord Jesus, we are yours and you are ours. I wonder if that's something that you say today. I wonder if you're somebody who counts Jesus as your Lord, as the one who's your king, who knows Jesus' presence as the one who's close to you by his spirit. If that's not you, well, maybe today would be the day where you come to Jesus and say, Lord, you have all authority. I really want your presence and your closeness in my life. Would you help me to walk with you? Would you help me to leave behind all that I have been and used to be and start a new journey, a new adventure? Give me new ambitions. Would you help me to know joy and pour it out to others? Maybe today is the first time you could pray a prayer like that. Maybe you've prayed that prayer every day for years. Well then, let's make it our ambition. If you're a Christian, if you're a part of Ammonfield Evangelical Church, if you're a part of the worldwide church, well, really, this is your future. This is your greatest task. This is our great commission, to make much of God's glory, to, to make him the passion of our lives and to share that passion, to share that glory, to share that joy with the whole of the world. It's an amazing ambition, isn't it? It's almost too big for us to get our minds around. It's almost too crazy to think that little people like us from a small town in West Wales could have any kind of effect on the future of the globe. But Jesus stands in our presence today and says, come on, I want you to be a part of it. All authority has been given to me and I'm giving it to you. I'll be with you as you go. My power, my presence, my blessing. So come on, let's go and share it with the world. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that this is true. It wasn't just to the 11 disciples that you said you were the king, that you would be with them, but it's to us. And you are the king of the whole world, Lord, of absolutely every single inch of it. And so, Lord, we pray that you would show us, show us how we can be a part of that, how we can pray what we should pray for, how we can give, Lord, who we should give to, how we might be able to go short term or long term. Lord, we want to give our lives to this ambition. We want to be part of your, your great commission to spread your joy, to spread your praise, to spread your justice, your goodness, your blessing to absolutely every corner of the world. Lord, we want to be people. We are those people today who look to you and say, you are ours. Lord, we belong to you. And because of the Lord Jesus, you now belong to us. You're our God. So we pray that you would be with us in power. Help us to know you as our King. We pray that you would be with us in presence, that you would give us your Holy Spirit, and that you would help us to know that you lead us and guide us, that we might be a part of this huge ambition, or that we might be a part of bringing your blessing and your joy to a world that really longs and needs it. Amen. Amen.